Turn your Bible to John chapter 4, and then we're going to be uh, in John chapter 20, so the book of John today. I'm going to kind of go through this quickly. I may not necessarily read uh, all of the scripture here. John 4, verse 1 through 42, actually covers this particular incident that Jesus has with the woman at the well. We're, we're, we're familiar with this story. So just to set it up for you, Jesus is beginning his traveling to preach the gospel. It's kind of early on, and uh, he's trying to teach his disciples that uh, his uh, way of doing things is going to be different than their mindset, different than the religious thinkers and the, the culture of the day. And Jesus is going to break all these barriers. He's going to do stuff on the Sabbath. He's going to tick a lot of people off. He's going to do things on purpose to get people to pay attention that you've emphasized the law, you've emphasized your own righteousness, you've emphasized the temple and all these things, and yet your heart is far away. You're missing the point of these things. And so Jesus does things on purpose as he's traveling, as he's on a mission, as he's walking with his disciples and teaching them and discipling them. And so in this particular passage, you'll notice it says that he had to go through a Samaria which is a place that the Jews did not like. They had no association with the Samaritans. They had had a war with them. There was bloodshed. They had a dispute about which mountain they should worship God on, and so they split off. And it's been just generational hatred, generational bias, generational racism, whatever you want to call it, between the Jews and the Samaritans ever since. Uh, and so Jesus says he had to go, but actually he didn't have to go. They could have gone around it, as many travelers and Jews would do, to avoid this place, the place of, of Samaria. And so but Jesus was like, no, we're going to go straight through here. And once again, it's on purpose that he's doing that. And so he goes as they're on their journey and says that Jesus was tired. Think about that for a second. Jesus was a man just like us. He got tired. They found Jacob's well. And so he, he sends the disciples. They're tired and they're hungry. He says, why don't you go ahead and go into town, this other town, close by and bring us some food. So Jesus sits there and follow well. Once again, it's, 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 it's on purpose that he's there. It's, it's midday. It's around noon. Okay? And this woman comes to the well. We, we know the story pretty well. Where it's shocking to, to her that he talks to her and the disciples come and are like, what's he doing speaking to this woman? Like, this is taboo. This doesn't happen. This is breaking down all kinds of barriers. Right? And he simply asks her for a drink. She comes to the well and she just says, could I have a drink? And she's like, well, how is it that you, being a Jew, are speaking to me, right? Like, this is not supposed to happen. What, is this a trick? Are you trying to, right? There's no trust there. It's like, I don't understand what's happening. This guy's mocking me, or something's happening, or this guy's going to rob me, or something. This guy's up to no good. I don't, I don't see what's happening here. And, of course, Jesus says, well, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for a drink, right? And I'd be giving you something called living water that would spring up unto eternal life, right? She's like, well, you don't have anything to draw with. How are you going to do that? He's like, I'll tell you what. Go get your husband and come back, and I'll give you this. And she's like, well, I'll take it if you're able to give it to me, even though you have nothing to draw with. She's like, well, I have no husband. What does Jesus say? Oh, no, the man that you're with is not your husband. In fact, you've had five others before this. Then all of a sudden, she's like, wait a minute. This isn't just some chance encounter. This isn't some weird guy. She says, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then immediately, as, as Jesus tells her about her life, reads her mail right then and there, perceives that he's a prophet, and then immediately she goes to worship, right? And says, well, what do you say? being a Jew, that we should worship here or there. This is what we say. This is what y'all say. Remember that? Interesting that immediately this woman who's coming there in the middle of the day, who's obviously a social out outcast. She's not with the other women that would come earlier in the day during the cool of the morning. She's coming out here by herself. She's had this particular life of rejection, you know, oppression, and whatever else that's going on. And here's this man talking to her, a Jew, going to give her a drink of living water that will spring up into eternal life, predicts, you know, or prophesies to her about what's going on in her life, and then she immediately wants to ask him about worship. And Jesus says some profound things to her that he hasn't said to anyone at this point. He hasn't said, he hasn't had a conversation. His disciples haven't even asked questions like this. This woman, once again, she's not just your average, ordinary, you know, woman at the well either. So Jesus is drawing some things out of her, some deep things. 
And she begins to ask about worship. He begins to answer. And of course, he tells her that it's neither going to be on this mountain or the mountain there, but it's going to be those that worship in spirit and in truth, right? For God is spirit, and those that want to worship him must do so in spirit and truth. And the Father is seeking those that will worship him this way. So this is the scenario. Once again, you can read it in detail on your own time, but I just wanted to give you the, the whole synopsis here. So let's break this down of what's happening, because here's what I want you to understand. Jesus is starting out his ministry. He, he gets tired. He goes, he's going to go through the town of Samaria. Once again, there's a, there's a reason why he's doing this, because we're going to fast forward to the end of his ministry in a little bit and see another encounter that he has with another woman. But I, want, I feel like we can pull some things from this particular story as far as what Jesus is trying to speak, what he's trying to offer, what he's trying to show us. So once again, visiting the town of Samaria, this place that had this, this horrible background, right? this great divide between the Jews and them. So they had no dealings with them, and yet Jesus goes there on purpose as one of his first you know, sort of missionary journeys, if you will. So here's the point of this then. So I'm just going to give you these one-liners. I'm just going to tell you what the point of it is. Just bam, bam, bam. Visiting the town of Samaria. What was this about? This is showing Jesus his desire, listen, to break off generational bitterness, biases, and curses, and to teach people to love and forgive their enemies, to bring peace, healing, reconciliation, and transformation. That's what Jesus is about. So he's trying to tell people, the reason I'm here, the reason I'm here with you, lady at the well, right? There's a bigger thing going on. I want to display the heart of the Father. I want to share the good news with people. I'm here to reach the outcasts. I'm here to bridge the gap. I'm here to bring peace and change. I want to reconcile people to God. I want to deal with generational things, with biases, curses, bitterness, I want to bring these things together. This is Jesus' ministry. He's visiting the town of Samaria. He's stopping at this place. Think about this. Jesus is tired. He stops at this well. Why? Because he wants to find, hey, I'm weary. I'm tired. I'm on a journey. There's got to be other people on a journey. There's got to be other weary travelers. Wasn't that what Jesus was about? He was going to places to meet with weary travelers to meet with drunkards, to meet with prostitutes, to meet with tax collectors, hello, to meet with lepers. He was going into these places, these dark places, these low places, these places that have been forgotten about, these places that have been rejected by man, by society. Jesus' whole point was to go to these places, to the thirsty ones, to the broken ones, to the desperate ones. Once again, this reveals Jesus' willingness to go to the lowest places and to the lonely ones to display his heart and compassion for the world, for humanity, and for the needy. And he comes at noon. So he's here, he's going through the town of Samaria, he's stopping at this particular well on purpose, and he's doing it at a particular time of the day, breaking social norms when this woman would be there. Jesus, here's my point, Jesus will meet you where you are. Understand this. We're, we're the woman at the well. Let's put ourselves in her shoes for a second. Jesus will meet you where you are with love and acceptance when everyone else has shunned you, given up on you, defamed you, and rejected you. That's the reality of what's happening here with the woman at the well. She's been rejected by everyone else. That's why she's here by herself. Been rejected by all these husbands. They're the ones that divorced her. A woman could not divorce men in that day and time. She's been rejected. She's feeling lonely, isolated. Jesus is going to meet her right there when she comes by herself in shame to draw this water. And he shows up there on purpose just to meet with her. He speaks to this woman. He's the one that initiates the conversation. Once again, this is a female in a society. You got to understand what it was back then culturally where women are both demeaned and disregarded. And this was a race, of course, traditionally despised by the Jews, and she's living in shame as a social outcast, and yet Jesus speaks to her. That's why she's surprised that this has happened. <coughs> Understand this. Jesus sees things, and he sees people differently, and he will go to the very ones that others do not value or that others consider weak or unworthy or disqualified. And he wants to affirm them and elevate them into their divine design and destiny. That's what Jesus is about. That's what he's doing. 
Here's what I'm saying with all these things that I'm talking about. Jesus goes to the things that are dead to bring new life. That's what this whole thing is about. The things that you guys have rejected and forgotten about, I have not. These ones that are broken, seemingly beyond repair, I've come to bridge that gap and to heal broken hearts and to raise people into newness of life. I want to give beauty for ashes. I want to give joy for mourning. Jesus is doing that right here at the beginning of his ministry. Not only does he speak to the woman, but he goes even further and asks her for a drink. This is unthinkable. Jesus is doing this. Of course, this, in the Pharisees' eyes, and the, the, the religious leaders' eyes, and their, and their tradition, it would have made Jesus ceremonially unclean to have a drink from this, from this woman. Think about that for a second. It would have made him unclean. But Jesus asked for a drink from her anyway. Here's my point. Jesus wants us, as broken as we are, as unclean as we are, as unworthy as we are, Jesus wants us to know that we have something to give. Hear this. He desires to receive from us our worship, our affection, our devotion. He will take what we have, what little we have, all right? He will take what we have and he will use it for his purposes and his glory. And that's what happens to this woman, right? She begins to ask him these questions, these deep desires of her heart, this curiosity, this searching for truth, this searching. She wanted to know God. She wanted to be in a right relationship with God. How am I supposed to worship? How do I connect with God? I'm full of shame. I have a broken you know, life. How can I come to God? How can I be received by him? How can I give myself to him? How can I put my life back together with him? How can I be reconciled to God? That was what was deep in her heart, deep in her soul. That was her longing. And Jesus begins to reveal to her these profound truths about the kingdom, about himself, about herself. He's actually listening to her and responding to her questions about worship, about prophecy. Here's my point then. For us, Jesus has secrets he wants to share, wisdom to impart, emotions to express, pieces of his heart to expose to us, to those who are willing to draw near, to listen, to be open, to be teachable, to honor him, and to seek him diligently. That's what his desire is, to share secrets of his heart. He wants to reveal things to us. As jacked up as we are, as many times as we've messed it up, as many times as God has spoken to us and we forget about it, as many times as God has fulfilled a promise or a prayer and we move on, He still desires to share His heart with us. He still beckons us. He still invites us to know Him, to be with Him in an intimate way. He still wants to use us. And that's the thing with this woman. She's one of the first people to receive revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. Remember, because that's the thing. Well, I'll go get my husband and all, but I'm just not sure about this. And, and I'm, I'm appreciative of this discussion. She says, but you know, when the Messiah comes, he'll reveal all these things to us. And what does Jesus say to her? The one that you were talking to, and he, I'm the one, I'm the Messiah. And she flips out. She all of a sudden, oh, you're not just a prophet. This isn't just a cute conversation we're having. You didn't just read my mail for fun. You're actually the Messiah, the one we've been waiting on. You've just revealed things to me, the deepest level of my heart. And she begins to leave. She, she leaves her, her water there, and she begins to run towards the town. And her, her whole thing is, Jesus didn't tell her what to say, didn't tell her what to do. But she begins to run to the town saying, come and see. Isn't that the same thing that, that Jesus was basically saying to his disciples? Come and see. Come and follow me. She goes immediately, come and see a man who told me everything about my life. She just didn't tell her everything about her life. You just mentioned that you had five husbands. <laughs> but she knew if he knows about my husbands, he knows everything about my life. <laughs> Something deeply spiritual had happened there. And all of a sudden, the scales fell from her eyes, and she couldn't wait to tell everybody, come and see this man. Could this be the Messiah? He told me everything about me. And he knows everything about me, and yet he's wanting to give me a drink. 
He's just revealed to me about worship. He's revealed to me who he is. She goes to invite everyone. And what happens with the town? They, they get all in an uproar. And Jesus and his disciples are like, what are we going to do? Let's stay here for a couple days. Let's see what happens. And there are people that, that believe. Some people believe just because of her word and what she explained. And they're like, wow, you're right. This is it. And others went out to see Jesus. And they said, we don't just believe just because of your word and your testimony, but we believe because we've heard it for ourselves. We've seen it for ourselves. And that's the thing about us and our journey with God and our witness and our testimony. There will be some that will be excited and believe and be like, okay, there will be a, a, a change. There will be a turning. There will be a step in the right direction. Others will, you know, ponder it for a while and they need to have their own experience. Their own, and that's true. They do. Others that will reject it outright. The point is, though, is that our testimony and our identity in Christ and how he wants to use us, it will produce. It will produce fruit. It is planting seeds. The Holy Spirit will take it and, and, and let the chips fall where they may. Some people are easy. You know, some people are like, yeah, they're hungry. They're seeking like her. And they recognize that she's this broken one and somehow the Messiah has talked to her. Somehow the Messiah has prophesied and, and given revelation to her. Others will have doubt and fear and everything else. Just like the Pharisees, they get jealous, they get bitter, they get whatever. The point is, though, she receives this revelation. She goes out. She begins to declare to people that she's seen the Lord. And for them to come and see. The question for us then, if she was able to respond in this profound way, and it was just because he just said, hey, you've had five husbands. And he tells her, we're not going to worship on these mountains. We're going to worship in spirit and truth. Which would have been like, what? That's never heard anything like this before. And you have living water. I mean, this was like mysterious, mystical. No one's ever taught like this. Where is that in the Torah? You know, where is that in the law? Where is that in the prophets? But she takes it as truth. She takes it as revelation from God himself. The question is for us then, how do we see the small things, the whispers, the short words, the faint impressions, the divine setups in our lives? Do we see it like she sees it? Do we respond like she responds? When we're thirsty and God comes and meets us in that dry place and gives us a drink? Restores us, refreshes us, forgives us, gives us grace. And the day in and the day out of our lives and our families. The thing is this, hear me on this. What you do with what you've been given matters. Just let that sit for a second. What you do with what you've been given matters. She has a, she has a God encounter here. And many of the people would come out and see Jesus and have their own God encounter. But not everyone who encounters God is changed or is able to sustain their experience. Think about that for a second. Because how you respond and how you follow through with what God has said and what God has done is what actually makes the difference. What you do with what you've been given matters. We could be in this, in this place and there could be a, a, a mighty move of God and people are falling out in the spirit and whatever else. But that doesn't mean that everyone that was in this room is going to leave out changed. It depends on what's going on in their heart. What is their heart response? What are they going to do after they leave this place? Are they going to put their faith and trust in Jesus? Are they going to change their, their ways? Are they going to follow him? You see what I'm saying? They can have a God encounter and get all the feels and all the thrills and then leave out of here. You see what I'm saying? Let's not be a people like that. Let's not come to church and throw up our hands and sing all these songs on Resurrection Sunday, right? And not live out this life that's been made available to us. Resurrection power, living water. We have something of worth, something of value. Christ wants to use us. He wants to flow it out of our lives. So here's this rejected outcast woman that Jesus encounters right at the beginning of his ministry. And then if you fast forward to the end, you can turn to John chapter 20 now. Now, Jesus has given himself on the cross. 
This is going to be the third day. And what happens? Jesus reveals himself to Mary Magdalene. Think about this for a second. Wait, Mary Magdalene, why would he reveal himself to her? Here he is at the very end of things. He's going to be resurrected in the first person that he chooses. Make no mistake, he, he, he's choosing. Once again, he's doing things on purpose. And he chooses Mary Magdalene, someone who had not one, not two, not three, but seven demons. So Jesus goes from choosing this woman who had had five husbands now to go and choosing a woman who had seven demons. You don't get to sit here today and say that you're unworthy. Say that God doesn't care. <laughs> he chose to reveal himself to a woman who was an outcast, had five husbands to the, at the well by herself, etc., etc. Then to reveal himself in his resurrected state, firstly to a woman who had seven demons. You're not, you can't, you're, you're not too far gone. I'm hoping and praying there's not anyone in here that has seven demons in them. But if you did, guess what? God wants to deliver you and redeem you and bring you near to his heart. He wants to use you. You, want, you have a testimony. The power of God. The resurrection power of God. To defeat that death. To defeat that darkness. To break every chain and every stronghold and every curse. This is who Jesus is. The women whose testimony that wasn't valid in court. These are the ones that he shows up to. The ones that society thought were weak and less than and ignored. Jesus says, I want to reveal myself to you. I want to heal you. You're not rejected. You're accepted. I see you. I see your pain. I see your situation. Not only do I love you, I want to reveal myself to you and use you for my glory. That's what happens. So we have this woman who has great deliverance happen, and then after that, she has great devotion. Do you know that she followed Jesus from that from that day after after he healed her and delivered her? And and, and it's scholars believe that she was actually a wealthy woman because the Bible talks about how she and others supported Jesus in his ministry. You know, Jesus and his disciples had left their jobs. They had no income. They had no ability to make money. Mary Magdalene and some of these others were actually giving to Jesus to help sustain. She had great devotion, which led to this great revelation. Great deliverance, great devotion, great revelation. Here's the thing. Not every gospel account, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have different things and highlight different things and different sayings of Jesus and different events and just a little bit different perspective. It's not contradictory. It's just different because they saw things differently through their own eyes, background and whatnot. But not every gospel account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection focuses on all. I'm saying that to say they don't all include the same events and details. But all four of them attest to the fact that Mary was there to witness Jesus' crucifixion and to witness his burial. All four of them say Mary was there. They don't agree and highlight all things, but all Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all said Mary Magdalene was there at the cross, at the burial. Many of the disciples weren't there, right? They weren't. They had ran away. There was a few. I'm sure they heard that, that, that she was there. And they all attest to this. So her connection to Jesus was undeniable. The healing that took place in her life on account of his miraculous presence inspired the entire rededication of her life to follow Jesus all the way to his burial until she could no longer physically see her Savior. Mary's desperate longing to be close to Christ and serve him in any way that she could became how she lived her life. Once again, she'd been healed of seven demons by Jesus and her loyalty to him was unwavering. She knew that she would not have a life if not for him. She knew she was dead. It was over with until she met Jesus. Everything changed. Everything turned around. So Christ, hear me now, Christ chooses this formerly demon-filled woman who's now filled with extravagant devotion to be the first person that he reveals himself to after his resurrection. This is not a small thing. This is profound. 
So look at this, John chapter 20, verse 1. Let's look at this just briefly. Early on the first day of the week, listen to this. While it was still dark. So Mary, Mary's coming early on the first day while it was still dark. Let me know Good Friday is good because Sunday's coming. And that's what's happening here. Early on the first day of the week while it was dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Think about that. While it was dark. Mary was not from this area. She was not from Jerusalem. So she knew the path to where they had taken Jesus. This requires serious... She had memorized. She was able to find her way in the dark. Think about her commitment, her devotion. I want to know where they're taking his body. She's going, right, to bring the spices and all that to anoint his body. While it was still dark, this is Mary's commitment. This is her devotion. Nobody else evidently had this level of devotion and commitment as she came before dark. She comes by herself. Now skip down to verse 11. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Here's her response. They have taken my Lord away. That's what she cares about. That's what she's focused on. This is her obsession yeah, to be with the Lord. They've taken him away. I don't know where he is. She's been with him all this time, and she's got this heart sickness. She said, I don't know where they have put him. She even uh, we'll just leave that in a minute. At this, verse 14, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Listen to this. This is interesting. Thinking he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. She was even willing to say, if you've stolen his body and you've got him under armed guard, just tell me where he is. I want to go get him. I'll go by myself. Whatever it takes, I don't care who's there. I don't care what the consequences. I want to go. Think about her bravery, her courage. Now, here it is in verse 16. Jesus said to her, one word, Mary. He says her name. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Isn't this interesting? That's what he says to her. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. Personalizing it to her. You don't have to worry about me not being here with you in the physical anymore. My Father is your Father. My God is your God. Wow. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples, verse 18, with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. A couple of things here. She responds, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away. She thinks he was the gardener. And then Jesus says her name. Here's the thing. Mary could not stand the thought of her Lord being distant. She couldn't stand the thought of being separated from him, of not being able to be aware of his presence. She was still wanting to pour out her love and affection on him. She was still committed to being with him wherever he was. And then all of a sudden, he calls her name. There's something that happens when God calls your name. When he calls out your name, there's something that happens on the inside. That's all it took was for him to say her name. All of a sudden, boom, rabbi, teacher. Whew. There's something about when we call on his name, but there's something when he calls on our name. What happens is, when we hear his voice and he's calling our name, 
He's healing our heart. He's revealing himself to us. The things that were blinding us, causing us to fear and doubt, suddenly melt away when he calls our name. All of a sudden, truth, truth himself and love himself comes to bind up our brokenness. That's what happens. This is what Jesus is doing when he's first resurrected. He's still reaching out to the, to the lonely, to the outcasts, to the ones that have been disregarded, to the ones that have been overlooked from the beginning of the ministry to the end. These are ones that had no life in that culture, no ability to have any sort of you know, freedom or authority or this or that. And yet Jesus is setting them free and giving them intimacy and authority with him. A place at his table, a place in his kingdom, a place. No, no, no matter what we take away today, no matter who you are, what's going on, what you've been through, it's the same way Jesus still, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still redeeming. He's still calling the brokenhearted. He's still drawing near to the outcasts. You don't have to have that orphan spirit anymore. The spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out all the Father. You don't have to be in fear you don't have to have worry. You don't have to wonder what he's thinking about you. You don't have to wonder whether or not you can be accepted or be cleansed because you can. If he can do it with the woman at the well, and if he can do it with Mary Magdalene, guess what? It's no problem for him to do it with you. And we want to think about the big miracles and, you know, all of this. Jesus is interested in building people. He's interested in restoring hearts. Yes, he wants to do all the other things. The reason why he's healing the sick and casting out devils is because he's compassionate towards people. He wants them whole. He wants them in their identity. He wants them free. He loves people. Amen? You know, the thing about Easter, I want to, I want to read something to you. I got, I got an email. Some of you guys may not know this, but I feel like I want to share it. You know, we oftentimes just scratch the surface of some of these things, of some of the truths, some of the reality of the kingdom and of the spirit. And sometimes maybe it's helpful to get out of our, our shoes, to get out of our Western American perspective, and maybe see it from somebody else who's in a different environment, a different nation, and how is it that they view the Lord? How is it that they worship? How is it that they trust God? How is it that they deal with their suffering and their persecution? How is it that they are devoted and committed to Christ in the worst conditions where they have nothing? That really takes the resurrection power of God to sustain them through the, the darkness that they're in all the time. And God does miracles. God supernaturally protects and provides does all kinds of things in the underground church in China and Iran and other places. But for those of you that don't know, you know, we, we've gone on mission trips to Haiti in the past and we're connected to a ministry there that has a school that is educating these kids and are feeding them food, both physical food and spiritual food, raising them in the Lord. And so many of you know that we sponsor these kids. They, they wouldn't have the ability to have the school and have what they have if not for those that are sponsoring these kids. And we do that every single month. There are those of you that in this room that may give, and there's others outside of this church that give. And one of the pastors that's involved at this school and in this ministry, he'll send me letters. He'll send me handwritten letters. Almost like every week, every other week, where he's handwriting a letter. Who does that? But he does it because he's so thankful to us. And he'll say, thank you for giving. We were able to get shoes for the kids. We were able to get books for the kids. We, we, we've got police everywhere and chaos everywhere, but God is protecting us. He's writing this. And then every month he'll send a, an email, and he, and he sent me this email, and I read it, and he, and he said, have a blessed Easter. And I was like, you're telling me to have a blessed Easter? You're talking about Haiti, one of the darkest places, Right? Most broken down, corrupt, poor places there are. 
And he is wishing us here in America with all our comforts and all our everything else to have a happy Easter. I'm like, Lord, help me. I need to be praying for this man. I need to be praying for those kids. I need to be thankful for what you've given us. I need to be thankful for where I live. I need to be thankful for so many things. So much life, so much blessing. So I began to read his email. I just want to share it with you. And I hope it will be an encouragement to you. He always, he always ends and begins his letter with scripture. It's fantastic. I want to be like this guy. I really do. Pastor Pierre. <laughs> he says, do not be afraid. It's Matthew 28. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Friends and faithful supporters of God's ministry. Greetings in the name of the risen Lord. The risen Lord is the base of the connection between you and us. I love that. The risen Lord is the base of the connection between you and us. Listen to what he says. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, there would not be a church today. He's right about that. There would not be hope that we who believe would be victorious over death. But we can say, oh death, where is your victory? The death and resurrection of Jesus had brought us together for this great cause in our mission. I don't know if you knew that the word LaCroix, or however you say that, LaCroix, I don't know how you say that. It literally means the and the cross. Their mission there is named the cross. And that was the first thing the Lord taught me when I arrived there to carry my cross and to follow him. And it was not easy. I would not be the person I am if it was not for Jesus who has revealed himself to me in a way I can understand, though I did not know him and have any experience with him. Think about that. Did the woman at the well know him and have any experience? No. Did Mary Magdalene? No. The ministry would not survive this hardship that the country has been going through for over three years now if the risen Lord were not behind it. He is the head and the owner of this work. We thank friends of Haiti for standing with us and for supporting this ministry. We thank you, faithful supporters, for letting God use you to support this ministry financially. Thank you for obeying God. We are working under him and we belong to him. Listen to what he says. You would not believe that the mission is functioning in the midst of the chaos that the country is in. Several schools are closed, yet everything is going as normal for us. Isn't that awesome? It's hard to believe, he says. Our teachers and our students are protected. All we can say is that this is the Lord's doing. The battle is not ours to fight, it's his. If the Lord is for us, who can be against us? The Lord is providing for his ministry through you so his people in Haiti can live through this famine that has been there for over three years now. Listen to what he says. You have fed thousands and thousands with your monthly donations. We are always at a loss for how to express our gratitude to you. Again, all this has taken place because Jesus, the Son of God, has risen from the dead. Let us continue to pray for God to intervene in Haiti in this way so that the Haitians can be free and live a life of freedom again. And then he quotes scripture. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What an amazing, what an amazing letter. What an encouragement to us. The famine, the chaos that's been going on over there for three years, yeah, they're still giving glory to God. Still worshiping God. Still their hearts are in alignment with Him. Still they're thankful for the fact that they have partners. The fact that the gospel could go forth. The fact that these kids can, can have food, can have nourishment, can have an education, can come to know Christ, can be taught the Word of God. And he says the thing that connects us is our risen Lord. Sometimes we just need to bring things a little bit back into perspective, don't we? It's the little things. It's the children, right? It's the children in these other places. They need the resurrection power of God. They need the sustaining life of God. They need the word of God. They need that care and acceptance and identity. In the midst of great darkness, in the midst of great corruption, there are people over there in Haiti 
trying to raise up this generation. And I'm wondering, that's what their priority is. That's what their focus is. And every day and every week, they're dependent on the Lord. And they're dependent on people like us to be able to give to them. I'm like, Lord, do we have that focus? Do we have that dependency on you? Do we worship you like that? Do we have that heart, that singularity, that wholehearted devotion to you? Do we have that brokenness before you? I'm just talking to myself. May like, Lord help us realign ourselves. The thing is, is that think about the woman at the well and you think about Mary Magdalene. They had to go through much pain and much suffering. And the Bible talks about that if we want to be glorified with Jesus, the path to that is we have to suffer with Jesus over and over and over again. I just don't know, once again, how much suffering. We've all got different levels of suffering, but it's nothing compared to many that are in places like Haiti. Right? In places in these other places. And I'm like, Lord, Give us your perspective. Give us your heart. Because suffering and persecution is going to come. And we cannot be caught up in our comforts and our convenience. We cannot be caught up in some sort of religious, ceremonious, you know, whatever thing where we're playing church and we're going through the motions and we have another holiday and another thing. And, but it's not actually impacting us. So we're not actually following through. I'm saying, Lord, change us from the inside out. Let us be a company of people that we're, we were buried with you in your death and we're raised to newness of life. We want to walk in that life. Everything that you made available, we want the fullness of it to come forth. We want to see it. We're going to pray. We're going to believe. We're going to stand for our nation. We're going to stand for Israel. We're going to stand for Haiti. We're going to stand for Vietnam and Myanmar and these other places that we're we're partnered with. Do you understand what you're a part of as the kingdom of God? Do you understand? This is the power of Christ in us. It's bigger than just pursuit church. He wants to change us individually, and then there's a corporate thing, and there's a global thing, there's a regional thing that he wants to do. And I just want to open our eyes to that life, to that world, to this kingdom of God. Because once again, death reigned from Adam on. And it talks about how at, at one point, at the very end of the book of Revelation, that death and Hades are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Well, how can just, uh, you know, death be thrown? In other words, death is a, a spiritual reality. A, there's, a, there's, a, there's a power of death that's real. It's going to be thrown into hell. Death and Hades is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. But what I'm telling you is, is that power and that principality of death, it reigned until Jesus came and broke its power. Hear me now. <laughs> there is life that is available. And we're supposed to reign in life through his grace, that the scripture says in Romans. Let me read you this. Romans chapter 8. And this is where we're going to close. Verse 10 through 17. I've been reading it. I read it during our Tuesday prayer. I just read it to the, the worship team in the back. I want you to hear this. And, and try to grasp this. We're going to close what this, what this scripture says. And it's out of the Passion Translation. It says, now Christ, this is Romans 8, verse 10. It says, now Christ lives his life in you. Just what? Christ lives his life in you? Wow. And even though your body may be dead because of the effects of sin, his life-giving spirit imparts life to you because you are fully accepted by God. The woman at the well, Mary Magdalene, fully accepted by God. You are fully accepted by God. And because of that, the life-giving spirit imparts life to you. Verse 11, yes, God raised Jesus to life. And since, listen to this. God's spirit of resurrection lives in you. He will also raise your dying body to life by the same spirit that breathes life into you. The spirit of God breathes life into you. Hello. So then, beloved ones, the flesh has no claims on us at all. 
And we have no further obligation to live in obedience to it. For when you live controlled by the flesh, you are about to die. But if the life of the Spirit puts to death the corrupt ways of the flesh, we then taste His abundant life. Have you tasted His abundant life? Don't you want to? The mature, listen to this, the mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that how you want to define your life? That how I grew up into, into the Lord, how I matured in Him, was I listened and responded to the impulses of His Spirit. Well, that's what we desire. Verse 15, you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. You have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God. And you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying these words of tender affection, beloved father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. And since, listen to this, we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. Come on, somebody. We will experience being co-glorified with him. Here it is. Provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. Accept his sufferings as our own. You know, in Psalm 69, it talks about the reproaches and the shame that has fallen on you, has fallen on me. This is David writing prophetically of Jesus, actually. <laughs> And he says, let me not put you to shame. Let me not dishonor you. This whole thing is, they're going to reproach you, and so they're reproaching me. They're going to dishonor you. They're dishonoring me. They're putting shame on you. They're putting shame on me. But no matter what happens, no matter how hard, no matter what the affliction, no matter what the condition, let me not dishonor your name. Through all the suffering, through all the persecution, let me stand fast. Let me hold to you. Let me cling to you and your truth. Of course, it goes on in the next verse and says that these present sufferings, right, are nothing in comparison to the eternal light of glory. These momentary light afflictions are nothing compared to the eternal light of glory that awaits us. That's what awaits us. Listen, we can, we can celebrate today. We can laugh. We can rejoice. Because the day of his resurrection, the great day of our resurrection, lies ahead. Like Jay said, former sinners made saints now. Eternal life begins now. Jesus said this is eternal life to know Jesus Christ, the one whom the Father has sent. You know him, you're joined to him, he breathes his life into you, you're raised up, seated with him in heavenly places. This is who you are, fully accepted, fully known, and fully accepted. Raised to newness of life. Whew. Thank you, Lord. So what I want to do is I, I want to play you this song. And man, it is, it is so simple, it's, it's, but it's so powerful. I want you to listen. I want you to hear the words. Man, I, I, I don't even know. I, it just got released. He had a version. This is Phil Wickham. And he had a version of this song. And he decided to release this you know, just before this Easter Sunday. So he released it. I guess he released it on Good Friday. <clears throat> and he decided to do like this acoustic slash piano version of this song. And man, I'm telling you, I watched it and I was like, that's it. <laughs> I can't not play this for the people on Sunday morning. I mean, it just hit me. And I'm praying that it's going to hit you too. And that it ties this whole thing together. Because, let me say this last thing. It wasn't just 
the woman at the well and Mary Magdalene, there's some women in between that as well. Remember the woman who broke the alabaster jar, right, at Jesus' feet? And they were rebuking it and saying, this could have been, you know, a help to save the, you know, to give money to the poor or whatever. And Jesus said, no, she's anointing me for my burial. And what she has done will be spoken of as a memorial to her wherever the gospel is preached. Once again, another, another woman coming in here and breaking all these barriers down. And she recognizes that Jesus is going to go and sacrifice himself. She recognized the disciples that they, they still didn't understand that Jesus was going to have to go to the cross. And here's this woman who comes in, recognizes who he is, and that he's that slain lamb. He's that one that's going to take away the sins of the world. She breaks the alabaster jar to anoint him for burial. The guys, the disciples didn't get this. It was this lowly woman who got it. It was able to present this devotion. And now Jesus said, anytime the gospel is preached, think about what she did. Remember Mary and Martha with Lazarus? And they come and they, oh Lord, if you'd only been here. Remember that whole deal? And Jesus said, you just need to believe. And then Martha makes the statement, you're the resurrection and the life. I believe you are. I believe you are. That, that we'll be raised in the, in the last day of the, re the resurrection. And of course, Jesus does confirm and say, you're right. I am the, res I am the resurrection and the life. Martha had this revelation. The guys didn't get it. I mean, think about this for a second. Jesus is revealing himself to these women. And this isn't, this isn't something, you know, for the women to, you know, the wives to be next to their husbands. And like, see there? You know, whatever. God will stuff to us. And which is true. But my point is, is that women in that day and time were, were a, a, a group that was not considered. That's what I'm saying. And Jesus turned that upside down. And began to value them, value the things that society overlooks and doesn't value. And he goes there to find worth and to elevate them. You hear what I'm saying? So my point is not to be feminist or to get points with the women in the room. That's not the point. I mean, I'll take whatever I can get. You know, I know I'm not head of my time. Girl power, whatever. Guy power. <laughs> but we're all... In the eyes of God, I'm just saying, think about what he's done, how he relates to us, how good he is. What an example he said. What a story he writes for us. That's my whole point, because he's trying to show us and display his heart for us. What he's done, how we're accepted, what's available. It's just so sweet, this love story, this romance, this way that God does things in a way that we just we just we we wouldn't do we wouldn't think about we would we would pass right by it all right let's get the lights <laughs> i gotta get out of the way holy spirit i'm just asking that you come i know that you move when we posture our hearts before you to worship and we just do that right now we thank you for the, the worship we had earlier. We thank you for this word. And we thank you for this worship that we're about to have. God, let it be pleasing to you. But God, let it strike our hearts in a way that, that, that we can break our alabaster jar. That we can drop our bucket at the well and go and say, come and see. That we can go and say, I've seen the Lord. He's alive. Come and see. Do something in us, Father, to shift our perspective, shift our priorities, that our, our faith and our hope are anchored in the fact that you rose from the dead. You defeated death, hell, and the grave. You broke the curse of sin and the law the death. You reign now, and we can reign with you through grace in this life. By your spirit, we're sons and daughters of the Most High. We pray that that spirit of adoption, that resurrection power would rise up within us as we listen to these words, as we worship you through this song. That revelation would hit us, would spark us, would change us. We want to have a God encounter that actually lasts. We want to have real testimony, staying power, steadfastness, faithfulness, God, 
to persevere through persecution, to persevere through our sufferings, to persevere through whatever pain, whatever disappointment, that we'll continue to lift up our eyes, to lift up our affection and devotion to you, no matter what's happening around us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do, what you've done already, what you're going to do. We just believe that greater things are yet to come. There's greater glory. There's greater power. There's greater miracles that are going to be released. We're believing it as crazy as it is here in Jefferson County, in Palm Bluff and White Hill, Arkansas, that you want to do it here in the lowliest place, in a place that's unlikely, that people have given up on, that there's so much brokenness in with poverty and addiction and lawlessness and all the things. You want to do it here in Palm Bluff, the outcast city. You've prophesied again and again that you want it to be a city of hope and a city of refuge. And we believe it, God. We say, yes, do it. And use us as a part of that hope, a part of that message, a part of that harvest. We thank you for it. We're going to listen to this song someday is coming. In Jesus' name.